The Enermax Liquitec TR42 all-in-one liquid CPU cooler has a massive contact plate made just for Threadripper and is rated for 500 watts of heat dissipation. High pressure PWM fans mount to rubber channels on the radiator to absorb vibration and the sexy logo and edge lighting on the block is addressable for syncing with your motherboard. It comes with an RGB control box too, so click the sponsor link in the description for more. Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back to Pulse Hardware. Today's video is about setting up FreeNAS in a Riptide. Riptide is my massive $10,000 plus build with a 16 core Threadripper based system in the top with two 1080 Ti's and in the bottom, there's a little FreeNAS system. And as I have gone through this build process, many, many people have asked me for a tutorial or a walkthrough. And I wanna be clear right from the get-go here, this is not necessarily going to be a tutorial. It's gonna be a walkthrough of my setup procedure. I've only really installed FreeNAS a couple times, so I'm not necessarily an expert expert, I will point you guys towards the resources I am using to set it up myself. And I will screen cap this process though, so you guys can get a better idea of what's going on as I go through the installation. But hardware is documented in my earlier Riptide video, so check that out if you wanna see what's exactly installed. I have been intending to upgrade the memory that's installed there to ECC memory though. So I have 16 gigs of ECC memory here from Crucial. It's not necessary to have ECC memory for FreeNAS, but it's recommended if you're very concerned about data integrity. and it's recommended to have about one gig of memory per one terabyte of storage. So 32 terabytes of storage via the four hard drives that are in there and then 32 gigabytes of memory via the two 16 gig sticks here. However, although ECC memory is compatible with Ryzen and Ryzen 2 processors on this platform, if the motherboard manufacturer enables it in the BIOS for whatever motherboard you're using, ECC memory does not currently work for any of the AMD APUs, which is what I specifically chose so that I would have enough expandability via the expansion slot that I didn't need a graphics card. Long story short, I can't use this memory with this configuration, at least not yet. We're hoping that when the Ryzen Pro APUs launch, which is supposed to happen in the next couple months, I think, we might see ECC support for these APUs. But for the time being, I'm gonna have to put those aside and switch to a non-ECC memory kit. So I have a Corsair Dominator Platinum kit right here, 32 gigs. I know this is Ryzen compatible. It's DDR4 3000 speed, which is perfectly fast. So I'm gonna install this so we can move on with our installation of FreeNAS. So first things first, upon booting up, I wanna double check the BIOS and make sure that we got all our hardware recognized. I did test this stuff beforehand, but it's now installed. So I did go for the memory and I plugged in the DOCP standard profile to give us DDR4-3000. And then I went over to advanced and looked at our SATA configuration to double check and make sure all four of the WD eight terabyte drives are being recognized there. And then if I go over to boot and check out our hard drive priorities, we can see we've got the Force MP500, we've got our Intel Optane drive, and we've got all four WD drives. So all of our drives that are connected are recognized. So now that I'm reasonably confident that the hardware is functioning properly and everything's plugged in and recognized, uh, let's switch over to actually getting FreeNAS installed. So I'm gonna need to create a USB FreeNAS installer. If you guys have gone through Windows 10 installation, it's the same general idea. So the first step is gonna be to go and download Rufus, which is a piece of software that can create bootable USB drives. And we're gonna use Rufus and the FreeNAS ISO to create a FreeNAS installation USB on this little Corsair 8 gig flash drive that I have. I might as well go ahead and plug this in. Make sure there's nothing important on it because it's going to be completely wiped. I'll put links to these download pages in the description, but the Rufus 3.1 is the version that we downloaded now. And then over on the FreeNAS site, they have a storage only configuration and storage plugins and virtual virtualization. I want to mess around with some plugins, including uh, Plex, for example. So I did download that version, 11.2 beta 2. Rufus doesn't need to install, you can just run the uh, EXE that was downloaded. It has automatically selected the only USB drive that I have installed and it wants us to select the ISO. So let's go back over to downloads and choose the FreeNAS 11.2 beta that we just downloaded. And then we'll go ahead and click start. It's gonna give us a warning that all the data is gonna be deleted and then we'll give it a minute while it writes that data to the USB and then we can use the USB to install FreeNAS. So pop that USB into the USB port on the back of the FreeNAS motherboard and turn the system back on. I would usually uh, hit delete to go back into the UEFI BIOS and change the boot order to boot off of that USB drive. But fortunately, since there's no other bootable devices on this system, it automatically went and did default uh, booting into the installation mode. And now, <laughs> throttling interrupts. 
So our installation has gone through successfully, although what I'm screen capping for you guys is just a mess because of this interrupt storm detected thing that we're getting. It's probably something to do with some of the USB ports on this motherboard that I might be able to disable in the BIOS. I'm looking up some information on hopefully trying to fix that, but the underlying installation does appear to have gone through successfully. So that was some interesting initial troubleshooting. The interrupt storm detected on IRQ265 issue has been solved now though. I initially tried to solve it by going in and disabling uh, USB devices and a couple other things in the UEFI because it seemed to be a device on the motherboard that uh, was throwing a repeating error that the operating system was picking up and just displaying on screen over and over again, which made it particularly difficult to navigate the command line interface that FreeNAS often uses. Ultimately though, I had to double check what version of the BIOS we were using using on this motherboard and we actually had a pretty old version. I think it was version 0400 something. And uh, recently there's an update about two weeks ago to a 901. So we downloaded that, put it on a USB, updated the BIOS. And now we have a nice clear look at everything because we're no longer getting that error thrown constantly. So that's good. Uh, actually, next step is internet. I have no internet here. So let me be right back. So ultimately I decided to go back and do a fresh clean reinstallation of FreeNAS just so I can show you guys what it looks like without all of those error messages popping up all over the place. So I went back into the UEFI and Asus motherboards have a boot override option you can do. So I just chose UEFI boot off of my USB drive with the FreeNAS installer on it. After that loaded up, I chose option one to boot off the FreeNAS installer, then option one again to do an installation or an upgrade. And then I went and chose from the list of drives that are connected my Intel Optane 32 gigabyte SSD to install to. I chose the fresh install option and then to do a full format on the boot device and then I confirmed that all of the data on this device will be deleted. All the data on all these drives is going to end up being deleted today. But after that it'll prompt you to create a root password which you definitely should do. Keep a password on this uh, and then I chose the UEFI boot mode rather than the legacy BIOS. After that uh, short wait for the installation to proceed, you'll see on screen console text pop up and scroll by. And then after a bit, you'll be prompted to reboot and it will tell you to remove the installation media because you don't want it to reboot and then boot off of your installer again. You want it to boot off of the disk you just installed to this time. After the reboot, there'll be a lot more on screen console text going by as files are copied, hardware is being detected and you will get a message to say this will take a long time. So I was prepared for a long wait, but it actually only took a couple minutes. But after installation is complete, you'll be presented with a simple command line interface. There's 11 options available there, which you should maybe take a look at. There's useful stuff available like shutting the system down, resetting the boot password, for example, but you'll also see a web user interface with an IP address listed. So you wanna copy down that IP address and then move over to a different computer that's also connected to the same network because now we can pretty much go headless with our free NAS and not even have a monitor connected to it. And we can control it and set it up via a different computer over the network via the web interface. So all you want to do is go to a browser and type in that IP address 192.168. Whatever the last digits are, you will then be prompted to log in. So use root and the password that you created. And from here we can get into actually setting up the NAS itself and configuring the drive. So in order to set up my four eight terabyte hard drives into a massive 32 terabyte data repository, I need to start by creating a pool. So for this, just navigate over to storage and then pools and then click add or create. Here you can choose the drives from the available disks section and add hard drives to the pool by either clicking the right arrow on them to add them to the data vdevs list or you can just click the suggest layout button and that will sort of take a look at the drives that you have and give a recommendation for what it recommends based on the hardware that's available it chose all four of my eight terabyte hard drives and recommended raid z2 which i went with because that's what i probably would have chosen to use anyway FreeNAS calls this layout and you can kind of equate it to a RAID setup if you've ever set up a RAID array before. In fact, they pretty much have the same names too. Mirror requires at least two disks and puts the same data on both disks. One can fail without losing data. RAID Z1 requires at least three disks uh, and one disk can still fail. You get a little bit more storage capacity that way. And RAID Z2 requires at least four disks, but two of them can fail. So you lose some storage capacity, but you gain redundancy. And since data integrity and long-term storage is a goal here, RAID Z2 it is. If you guys watched any of the build videos on the FreeNAS system, you know that I have two SSDs in there. The Optane drive is what the FreeNAS operating system is installed on right now, but I have a second SSD in there, 120 gig Corsair MP500 that I wanted to use as a cache. There's actually two different types of cache with FreeNAS. There's Zill and there's L2 Arc. There's a lot of depth with both of these. I'm gonna give a very simple explanation as to why I'm choosing what I'm choosing, but Zill is ZFS intent log and it can help with write speeds, uh, but probably not for a home setup. It's more for people who are 
we're integrating these into servers and enterprise environments. Also, they are recommending a battery backed up SSD for a Zill cache, and that is simply because if that drive were to fail, you would actually lose data on uh, your FreeNAS setup. So I don't want that, and I don't have a battery backed up SSD, so I'm not doing the Zill cache. L2 Arc is a read cache. Uh, this can help with read speeds, but again, only in certain situations. It's also gonna eat up some of your system RAM, so you should only really bother looking into set up, setting up an L2 Arc cache if you're already maxed out on system RAM, which I am. So since I have the hardware, I am gonna go for that uh, and use the 120 gig Corsair Force MP500 as my L2 Arc cache. Uh, and hopefully I'm gonna report back and do a follow-up video on some of the performance and stuff with this. And uh, FreeNAS does have a built-in monitoring tool that you can use to see if you're actually getting any benefit out of that. So hopefully for home use, I'll be able to come back and tell you guys if that was actually even worth it. So now that I've set up my pool, I can see it here in the dashboard, but in order to use that pool, the setting up the pool is kind of like creating a RAID array. Uh, we now need to create data sets on that pool, and that's kind of like creating partitions on a RAID array to, to some degree. So, so we're gonna go back over to storage here. We're gonna choose pools. We're gonna select our big 32 terabyte pool, at least, or whatever you named yours, and we're gonna click add data sets. Here, there are various options you can go through as well as an advanced mode where you can tell it like how much uh, data it ac should actually use, uh, but I'm not gonna bother with any of that, I'm going to go to basic mode. I'm gonna have it inherit most of the stuff that I set up from the data pool, but I'm gonna name this media. And uh, one of the things you can do with data sets is create different ones with different rules and different levels of access and the ability to have it backed up as well with a snapshot. Since media is like TV shows and movies and music and stuff that is theoretically replaceable, I don't want it backed up. It's also probably gonna be a lot of space. So I'm just gonna to go to the share type, switch that to Windows and click save. And now under our big 32 terabyte pool, we have a data set called media. It is there and we are almost ready to actually access it and start saving stuff to it. In order to do that though, we need to go over to sharing. And uh, since we're using Windows based machines here at my home, we're gonna choose a Windows SMB share. We're gonna add one up here. We're going to direct it to the path we want to direct it to. Direct it to our media data set here. Uh, go ahead and name it media. And we're gonna allow guest access. Uh, what you probably wanna do for security is create users and give them individual access, but for now, a guest access will be just fine. We can also add a periodic snapshot task, but we're not gonna do that right now. We're just gonna hit save. So to recap, all your drives go into a pool, data sets get created on that pool to separate your different data out, and then you create a share in order to share that on the network. At this point, if you've done everything correctly, you should be able to go over to your network on a network attached computer. You should see your free NAS there, and then your share that you just created should be available for you to go ahead and start using. So I'm not gonna go back and create one more data set, and this one's going to be specifically for records. Basically, I want the data in that data set to be backed up. Important stuff, you know, if you have tax info or whatever else you want to save. Uh, so first I will create the new data set and I'm just going to call it records. So there it is. And I can create instantaneous snapshots, just a one-time backup if you want, but I actually want this to do this automatically. So I'm gonna go up to tasks and periodic snapshot tasks. I'll go ahead and create a new one. So here we're gonna choose the uh, records data set that we just chose. Uh, we can tell it how long to keep the snapshot. We can tell it when to begin and end the task, which I probably wanna have it do in the middle of the night. You know, we'll say like 2.30 in the morning. Sure, that sounds good. And uh, we can let it run for an hour. And then the interval, I'm just gonna have it do it once a day. And uh, right now it's got Monday through Friday, but let's have it do the weekends too. So go ahead and save that. It's enabled. And now this task should run every day at the set time. And then it'll save the snapshots into a directory on the FreeNAS. Now that I've created a share for it, I can go and see that on the network. And then from here, you can actually go to properties and previous versions. There's none right now because it's not 2.30 in the morning, so it hasn't run yet, but you'll be able to see previous versions here and then you would be able to recover that. And the cool thing is the snapshots that are created are, are read only. So even if you get hit with uh, like a crypto locker a virus or something like that, you should still be able to rec recover your most important stuff from those snapshots if you really need to. Now guys, I was initially planning to make this video a bit longer and a bit more in depth, but some stuff has come up this week that is exciting, but also has caused me to lose a lot of time. So the upshot is I have some really cool videos coming up very soon that I think you guys will be interested in, but this initial setup video for the FreeNAS, I've had to limit to really just kind of the basic steps to get things up and running to actually access it on my network. I do have another FreeNAS video that I made for my old setup. So if you guys want to check that out, I have a few more details that I go into there. Of course, it is the older version, so the UI is different, but essentially it's the same type of functionality. If you enjoyed this video, though, hit the thumbs up button and, uh, of course, subscribe for more tech videos coming at you very soon. Thanks again for watching, guys, and we'll see you next time.